Good morning from the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. I'm NASA's Josh Byerly. Coming up in March, Expedition 35 on board the International Space Station will get kicked off. And it's going to be an incredibly busy time with quite a number of visiting vehicles, spacewalks that are planned for the crew, and also a ton of science. Here to give us more details about what's ahead for Expeditions 35 and 36 is Mike Suffredini, the International Space Station Program Manager, as well as Tony Sicacci, a NASA Flight Director. And we are also joined by Dr. Julie Robinson, the Space Station Program Scientist. We're going to hear from each one of them, and then we'll take some questions. We'll start with Mike. So uh, good morning. It's uh, good to be here again and talk about uh, the ISS program and where we're headed for the next uh, few months. Uh, in fact, we're going to discuss with you today increments 35 and uh, 36 as well, and that takes us to, uh, towards uh, to, towards the end of the summer of this year. And so, uh, of course, quite a bit going on. Uh, before Tony, Tony walks you through uh, the details of those uh, increments and, and Julie talks to you about the research involved, I thought I'd just give you a uh, a few uh, highlights of uh, near-term activities and, and talk a little bit about the vehicles that are about to come uh, to ISS during that period. Uh, on board, everything's going very well. We have a few uh, minor anomalies we work through. That's not uh, unusual. We have uh, one of the KU band systems has uh, a, a transmit problem or from an ISS perspective, a receive problem. Um, that we're uh, uh, working through uh, probably end up being a, a failed transceiver that we'll have to change out as part of an EVA uh, at some point. Of course, we have two systems, and so we've got all the comm we need right now. Um, and so we'll have to talk about uh, when we uh, finally finish our failure investigation, what we do with that. Uh, we do have in the Columbus module, one of the coolant pumps is down. Again, that's a redundant pump uh, that we found out when we were swapping over just to check out the system. Uh, so it's uh, it's been uh, nagging us a little bit, and so we'll we'll work through that a bit and decide uh, where, what what next steps uh, should be. On our power systems, largely everything's going well in the power in the power side. We've uh, had a few anomalies over the past few months that we've sorted out. However, one of our we call them sequential shunt units on the starboard uh, inboard array has been acting up, and uh, we've. Um, uh, had a few uh, what's called power on resets and this is where the system itself um, resets itself if it thinks it has uh, some sort of minor anomaly uh, but there hasn't been any anomaly so the system's gone through a reset every so often um, that was occurring uh, semi-regularly for uh, for several days and then as of Sunday I don't think we've seen any since Sunday so we're looking at that uh, so, um, overall though, we've had, uh, this is a kind of a low traffic period for us on ISS and therefore we've done a really good job of focusing on research. Um, as, as you've heard me say many times, our, uh, our requirement is to get at least 35 hours a week of research. Uh, over the last several weeks we've been averaging something closer to about 40 to 45 hours a week. Uh, so the team is doing a really good job of uh, preparing for or, or conducting research on board ISS. And I think with these increments coming up, uh, you'll see us to continue to focus on that uh, as we also at this point, you know, as we get towards the spring time frame, we will change out the crews as we go from, uh, from 34 to 35 and 35 to 36. Uh, so you'll see some, some crew change out and also uh, I think Tony's going to touch on this a little bit, we're considering um, a, uh, the Russians already have planned a couple of EVAs and we're considering a, uh, uh, perhaps a set of EVAs in the middle summer time frame in order to uh, take care of a backlog of things that we need to get done outside, which would include uh, replacing this, uh, this failed uh, transceiver I talked about uh, a little bit earlier. So on board, everything's going very well. Um, on the ground, of course, we're preparing for our next several flights. We've got a progress. The next flight to uh, ISS is a progress, we call it 50 progress, that uh, launches on the 11th of February. Um, uh, from a U.S. Uh, logistics standpoint, we have uh, the next SpaceX flight uh, is the SpaceX uh, 2 flight uh, to ISS and it's currently scheduled for March 1st and I don't see anything that would uh, keep that from, uh, from happening, at least not today. Uh, of course, we're, uh, the, the objective for the first half of this year is to, uh, to get the demo flight off, the orbital uh, demo flight. So we'd like to see the Cygnus spacecraft at ISS uh, sometime in the summer time frame. And so uh, that's going very well. In fact, today they're doing the last step in the cold flow test. 
uh, out at the Wallops launch facility uh, this afternoon after lunch. I think they'll get the, the uh, they'll start the flowing of the of the uh, propellant in order to uh, uh, test that whole system, uh, and then uh, that'll be followed up immediately. Uh, at the end of January by a, a hot fire test, uh, uh, which has uh, been in the works for some time. Uh, and then the plan is to have the test flight that we've talked about in, in roughly the March, early spring time frame uh, with a uh, with the possible launch of the demo flight, uh, hopefully in the uh, uh, summer time frame. Uh, so that's the plan for the orbital a vehicle and uh, many things have come together with the getting the pad ready and the vehicle ready to go fly. Uh, they've overcome a number of hurdles and so uh, I think the schedule's starting to stabilize on that system and so we're looking forward to it uh, coming to ISS as well. So overall in the program we're, we're doing very well and uh, I'll hand it over to Tony uh, and to Julie to tell you more about the specifics of what's coming up in these next couple of increments. Thank you. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to say something, Josh. Just get it all kicked off. We'll say good morning uh, to everyone. Like Mike said, uh, my plan today is basically give you a quick summary of all the major events we'll be doing during both uh, the increment 35 and 36 time frame. And uh, based on our current schedules, and like Mike said, they're, they're working and negotiating uh, uh, various schedules and where we're going to uh, execute these things. Uh, see, as far as uh, lead flight directors. I will be the uh, lead for uh, increment 35, and I'll be back up for 36. And Gary Horlocker, one of my uh, flight director compadres, will be doing the uh, lead for increment 36, and I will be back up, or like, uh, and he will be back up for me on increment uh, 35. Uh, to, uh, let's see, uh, paint a complete picture, I wanted to talk about who's on board the station as of today. And that way, uh, you can see here, crew, I'll go left from right. It's Oleg uh, Novitsky, of course, Kevin Ford, who is the uh, CDR of Increment 34. We got uh, Evgeny uh, Torenkin, uh, Roman Romanenko, we got Chris uh, Hadfield, and uh, Tom Marshborn. So those are the crew on board. Let's see, uh, Increment 35 start. Uh, the Increment 35 start officially begins uh, with the departure of the 32S crew. Uh, and that'll start off uh, prior to departure, of course, we have the uh, traditional official handover ceremony where uh, Kevin Ford, the Increment 34 CDR, will hand over command of the ISS to uh, Chris Hadfield, Expedition 35 commander. Of course, uh, this will be the first uh, uh, commander uh, for Canadian to take over, so uh, I know the Canadians are happy about that. And when that occurs, uh, it'll begin the uh, Increment 35's tenure. The schedule undock of the 32S uh, crew is on March 15th. Uh, of course, Kevin, uh, Oleg, and uh, Evgeny will return to Earth after 143 days uh, uh, in space, 141 of those on board the station. Uh, the Increment 35 crew begin with, uh, and again, here's Roman and Tom and Chris. Uh, they'll be uh, starting their uh, three, or we call it a half crew, three person uh, increment for about 16 days. And just uh, uh, for a side note, today is their 30th day on space. Uh, let's see, of course, uh, I'm sure you guys already know about the increment uh, 35 crew, but just a quick summary. Uh, Chris Hadfield, this is, uh, he has uh, three previous space flights. Uh, Tom Marshborn had one previous, and uh, Roman had one previous uh, space flight. So they're, uh, they're experienced, and uh, they're working hard, getting caught up uh, on the everyday station activities. Let's see here, as far as uh, the 34S crew arrival, that'll, that crew will complete the uh, increment 35 team complement, get us up to six uh, crew members. Uh, basically, the increment 34S crew will arrive about 17 days after the 32S uh, departure. And that'd be on March 28th. And uh, right now, they're scheduled for a March 30th uh, uh, docking. And I know there's discussion about uh, docking uh, within four revs, and I think it has a couple uh, uh, additional discussions that have to be made to determine if that's what we want to do. But basically, a 34S will uh, dock on MRM to the, of course, uh, the SM Zenith docking port. And that crew uh, from left to right will include uh, Chris Cassidy. This will be uh, Chris's second space flight. And uh, what's unique is uh, he previously flew on STS-127 with Tom. So that was their uh, 
for space flight together. Uh, Pavel Vinogradov, he'll be the uh, he'll be the Soyuz 34S commander, and he also will be the uh, Increment 36 commander. And then uh, Alexander Zirkin, he will be a flight engineer. Let's see, if we get the next one, uh, Increment 35. Six crew pitcher. Here's all the folks together, and they'll be uh, on board to uh, bringing the complement back back to six. Uh, let's see. Mike talked about a bunch of visiting vehicle traffic, but before I wanted to talk about that, I thought it would just be simple to finish up the uh, um, Soyuz traffic and uh, talk about when the 30, increment 35 will end and 36 will begin. So uh, we'll transition to increment 36, of course. Uh, after the 33S crew uh, departs, and like I talked about before, we'll do the uh, uh, traditional handover ceremony where uh, Chris, who is the increment uh, 35 commander, will hand over uh, the station range to Pavel. See, uh, the schedule on dock of the 33S Soyuz from the ISS is May 14th. Uh, of course, Chris, Roman, and Tom coming down on the Soyuz and returning to Earth after 146 days on space, which 144 will be on the station. See, and, that, and at that point in time, the increment 36 guys will be in their uh, half complement crew, and uh, of course, there's their 36 pads. At this time is when uh, Gary Horlocker will be taken over uh, as the uh, lead flight director for the increment. See, 35S arrival. Well, of course, we only have three uh, increment 36 crew members on board, so we need to get the other three up there. Here you see uh, 35 Soyuz is scheduled to arrive on May 9th. I'm sorry, May 30th. Uh, and we'll dock to the uh, MRM FGB, MRM-1 FGB Nader. Of course, and the crew left from right, it'd be uh, Karen Nyberg. This is Karen's second flight. She flew on STS-134. Fyodor uh, Yurchikin, this will be his uh, fourth space flight. And then uh, my paisan, Luca Parmitano, this will be his uh, first space flight. And that'll bring the Increment 36 uh, crew up to the sixth complement. Let's talk about uh, visiting vehicle traffic uh, a little bit. I know Mike uh, talked a little bit about the progress is coming up. Uh, what I like to do is just go through uh, through the whole increment, 35 and 36, we'll be having uh, three undocks and, of course, two launches and two dockings. You can see here the uh, progress uh, um, coming towards the station. And you know, all you guys know that this is an automated rendezvous uh, that will dock to the station. Uh, I'll just give the quick dates. Uh, let's see, we do have 49P is already on board. And that's going to uh, undock on April 15th is the plan. And I think we're going to have each one of the uh, where the uh, locations of the different uh, uh, progresses or docking and such. Uh, 50P undock is going to be uh, April 23rd. We have a 51P launch. It's going to be April 24th and docking on April 26th to the uh, docking compartment one. 51P will undock on July 23rd. And then 52P launch uh, will be July 24th, docking in 26. And that will be all the progress traffic during the uh, increment 35-36 uh, uh, time. I think uh, commercial crew, Mike talked a little bit about uh, the schedules for that. The dates that I presented are basically what's on the uh, baseline that came out in November. And like, uh, again, uh, Mike said they're uh, still discussing uh, different uh, launch dates. and and unburst and such, but I wanted to talk first about uh, SpaceX. Of course, SpaceX will be there uh, birth to Node 2 when the increment 35 starts, so they'll be doing a lot of work with that. Unbirth right now is uh, scheduled for April 2nd. I know we're still having discussions on uh, if that's the day uh, we're going to unbirth or not, but that's currently on the manifest. As far as the uh, orbital commercial traffic, uh, Mike already talked about uh, trying to get uh, uh, the demo mission one made in voids of the uh, Cygnus uh, up to the station currently, and I know that it's going to change. Uh, launch is April 5th with uh, docking April 10th, and basically it's a standard thing. What we've been doing is with SpaceX where the crew will go ahead and uh, uh, grapple it and berth it to the uh, Node 2 uh, Nader port. And right now on the schedule during the increment time frame, uh, we have, do have Orbital 1 for August 13th, but I know based on when uh, D1 launches, uh, we'll uh, adjust that uh, launch as required. See, uh, 
ATV4, that's uh, scheduled to come up during our increment. Again, another uh, automated rendezvous, and that will be docking to the uh, uh, after the uh, SM. See, the launch right now is scheduled for April 18th, uh, docking May 1st, and then uh, undocking will be uh, after our increment, but uh, October 15th, just to close that out. As far as uh, HTV, again, uh, the launch for HTV is uh, no earlier than July 15th. And uh, capture and birthing will be on July 20th. And unbirth and release will be uh, August 19th. So Mike talked about uh, the EVAs. Right now, the Russians have four EVAs uh, scheduled during the increment time frame. The first one, uh, uh, spacewalk number 32, it'll be uh, Roman and Pavel doing that one. And then they have uh, 33, 34, and 35, June 26, August 15th, and August 21st. And Fyodor and uh, Alexander will be doing those three uh, EVAs. As far as uh, US EVAs, like Mike discussed, uh, right now three EVAs are under evaluation, uh, consideration for the June-July time frame. Uh, like it, Mike had talked about, uh, last year we had some uh, EVAs, we had contingency EVAs that we had to go out and, and perform for the MBSU and uh, try to determine uh, leak troubleshooting on the, the 2B solar array. So a lot of tasks got uh, removed from the list. And uh, for this summer, it looks like the best uh, time to probably uh, complete those tasks, get caught up to date. And of course, we're still looking at uh, sergeant, sergeants and see if we want to relube those and also the AMS possibly putting a uh, MLI cover on that due to some of the thermal concerns that they've been seeing. Uh, let's see, and for those EVAs, I didn't mention that, it would be uh, Chris Cassidy and uh, Luca performing those. As far as uh, the increment, increment 36 completion, uh, increment 36 comes to an end with the departure of the 34S crew, and their departure uh, is scheduled for September 11th, and prior to that, of course, uh, Pavel will be handing over the command of the ISS to Fyodor, beginning the increment 37's tenure. And uh, let's see, as far as the uh, 34S crew, they'll be coming home on September 11th right now as a schedule like I talked, and they'll be uh, up in space for 167 days, uh, 165 of those uh, on board the station. Let's see, and that's all I have for you is a quick summary of uh, the major events. So I'll hand it over to Julie to talk about all the uh, neat science stuff we'll be doing on the station. Well, thanks, Tony. You know, all those operational activities that, that Tony just talked about are really for a reason, and that reason is to carry out the robust research program that we have going on on the space station. So for Expedition 3536, I'm just going to give you a, some brief highlights of a few select investigations. Overall, we have just in Kibo, Columbus, and Destiny, we'll have over 137 investigations active uh, during Expedition 35 and 36. Uh, 80 of those are led by U.S.-funded or U.S.-supported investigators. About 25% uh, of our investigations are sponsored under the declaration of ISS as a national laboratory. This uh, started back in 2005 when we were, de we were declared a national laboratory by Congress, and that represents our users that are from other government agencies, uh, commercial companies, the private sector, and nonprofit organizations, so they're not funded by NASA. Uh, we're also uh, serving the needs of over 400 investigators um, from around the world, and those investigators represent 28 different countries. And uh, you saw in the, in the graphic that was up, uh, those colors represented the different disciplines. And so we have uh, biology and biotechnology, earth and space sciences, education and cultural activities, human research focused on human physiology and future exploration, physical sciences, and technology development and demonstration. So with that number of investigations, obviously I can't give you a very detailed rundown of most of them. What I did was select five investigations covering that breadth of disciplines uh, linked to some of our past research results and um, that are kind of new in this uh, starting up in Expedition 35. So the first I want to talk about is from the biology area, and it's called microbiome. Uh, some recent discoveries over the last few years in the microbial sciences have shown us that bacteria account for basically 10 times more cells in our body than our, ver our own cells. So we're outnumbered 10 to 1 everywhere we go by the bacteria that we carry with us. And we know that in space flight, bacteria uh, grow quite differently. We also know that the human immune system is affected significantly. 
And so what we'll be doing in this project is uh, collecting samples from ISS crew members before, during, and after their missions to the ISS, and also looking at the environment of the ISS and the diet and other aspects, other ways that humans um, have bacteria come into their systems. And we'll be looking at their uh, stress levels and their immune system function as well. It's important from an exploration perspective uh, because this research will help us predict how long-term space travel, which is basically humans and the microbes that go with us, uh, is going to affect those communities, those ecological communities. But also, it's really important because it's addressing a, a top recommendation of the National Academies of Sciences last year when they suggested that ISS needed to be developed as a microbial observatory to address some of these new findings that have been made across the scientific community. And so this is one of the first studies that really starts addressing that recommendation. And that's important because of the benefits back here on Earth. If we can understand how microbial communities work and take advantage of the ISS as a relatively isolated environment, there's a lot of basic science and then improvements in health on Earth that we can make. Moving to human physiology, we have a new investigation starting in Expedition 35 called Ocular Health. And this is an important investigation because it builds off a discovery made through our space medicine about two years ago. It will be the first experiment to characterize the risk of what we're now calling microgravity-induced visual impairment and intracranial pressure. Essentially what we've discovered is that astronauts, some astronauts on orbit, not all of them, but uh, they have real changes in fluid shifts in their bodies and uh, that that leads them to uh, both have changes in their vision and also changes in the pressure in their central nervous system. About 20% of the astronauts that have flown to the International Space Station have reported these kinds of vision changes. So what we're going to be doing is taking detailed scientific measurements. Here you see uh, Sunny uh, having some tomography measurements taken of her eye. You may have had something like this in a doctor's office where you have some anesthetizing eye drops and then they use that direct contact to tap and actually measure the pressure of the fluid that's inside the eye. Uh, you also saw some video of ultrasounds and, uh, and here's another instrument being used to characterize the eye. So we'll be taking systematic measurements to really try and understand this process for the first time. This is an example of why we really need long duration human spaceflight with multiple crew members to understand all the different effects on the human body. But it's also interesting that, that this is a, a process that was not predicted from what we know about human health on Earth. And we even have some results now that have come out that suggest that what we're seeing in astronauts in orbit could link to ways of understanding cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, and other aspects in, uh, in people on Earth that might not be quite as healthy as our astronauts are in orbit. Uh, and so, uh, so we're really excited to have this important study kicking off. It will take place over about two years. Next, I want to shift from human physiology focused on exploration to technology demonstration focused on exploration. And really, just yesterday on ISS, we started a study called UBNT, or Ultrasonic Background Noise Test. Uh, this uh, test is to observe the high frequency noise levels that are background on the International Space Station and develop an understanding of what those noise levels are so that we can then develop a tool to uh, automatically detect leaks. You can think of a leak as having some kind of a hissing noise and these ultrasonic detectors, and you see a training video here of uh, someone putting the epoxy on one of these detectors and actually attaching it onto um, the space behind a rack. And uh, basically what, we'll, what the acoustic engineers will be doing is developing a profile of what normal noises are like inside the ISS, and then they'll be able to start developing algorithms to detect abnormal noises, including the kind of noises you might get if there's air leaking through the pressure wall. And so this will be an important advance in the way that we approach spacecraft safety and leak detection for future exploration missions. Next, I'll shift from uh, technology demonstration to some, a more fundamental physical process, and that is combustion. Last year, we had a really neat discovery in our combustion rack, and uh, based on one of the, the combustion experiments we were doing where we were burning uh, very simple fuels, uh, in this case, heptane, heptane drops, and we, this was from an experiment called FLEX. It was the first time that scientists had observed a low temperature, soot-free, cool flame. Now, cool flame sounds kind of strange. A normal flame is about 1,400 degrees Celsius, and a cool flame is about 600 degrees Celsius. We have a video to show you uh, from the inside of the combustion rack that shows you what this observation is. So you see the droplet. The droplet's ignited, and you see the burning go on. Then you'll see an extinction where it gets dark, it goes out, but the flame, the burning actually continues. And then in the end, you can see that through a chemiluminescent afterglow. 
that comes back afterwards. And so that's how scientists know that the flame continued to burn. Uh, so this is, has really important applications on Earth because this is something you just can't study any other way. This kind of droplet staying in one place and being controllable and measurable without having convection drawing a flame upward in the point that we normally see, say, when we're burning a candle on Earth. This is a, a fundamental property of combustion you can only study in space. And this gives us some insights and some ways to improve internal combustion engines because this kind of cool flame property, if you can control it better on Earth, would help you to control combustion in a way that could make engines more fuel efficient. The experiment that we'll be starting in Expedition 35 is a follow-on to the flux investigation data I just showed you. It's called the Italian Combustion Experiment for Green Air, or ICE-GA for short. And here you can see a picture uh, in front of the combustion rack as a, as a gas bottle is being put in. And it's a collaboration with the Italian Space Agency. Instead of burning things like heptane, decane, or, or uh, octane, we'll be looking at second and third generation uh, biofuels. Second generation biofuels are, instead of being made from corn or soybeans, they're made from any kind of excess biomass, so they're not competing with food production, and third generation biofuels are the ones that are made from algae. So we'll be testing combustion in the, in the combustion rack using these different biofuels. And this is obviously very applied at getting insights that will help us to improve the efficiency of combustion with biofuels. Finally, I'd like to shift to the earth sciences and talk about um, a, an important earth science remote sensing instrument on ISS, the HICO, or Hyperspectral Imager for the Coastal Ocean. You can see a picture of that here out on the, mounted externally on the Kibo Laboratory. Hyperspectral data is essentially hundreds of spectral bands instead of just a few like Landsat has. And so this gives you a lot more information about what you're, what's being observed and, and measured on the Earth below the instrument. As of January 1st, this instrument has transitioned from being just a naval research operated payload for the Naval Research Laboratory to being a facility on the International Space Station. And this opens it up to a wide array of users, both national lab users from other government agencies and the private sector, especially users that are focused on agribusiness and oil exploration. And it also opens the instrument up to more access to our NASA users that are funded by the Science Mission Directorate um, in studies of the Earth system. So we're excited about that transition. And I wanted to close by showing you uh, one example of what the Environmental Protection Agency has done with hyperspectral data. Uh, they had a Pathfinder Innovation Project exploratory grant from their Office of Research and Development at EPA. And this is one of the results of those. This is Pensacola Bay, Florida. And if you see the little red parts of that image, they took data from HICO and they processed it. And those little red areas represent where there's significant nitrogen coming into the bay and causing blooms of algae. And so they use this uh, by combining their in-water measurements with the remote sensing measurements. They've used it to develop a predictive system that they can use for monitoring the water quality in Pensacola Bay. They're now working to expand this to more bays around the Gulf Coast region and even to look at other EPA regions and see if they can extend this. And uh, both, uh, both, so both the research oceanographers at EPA as well as their Office of Research is um, continuing to support expanded use. So this is the kind of use of HICO as, uh, as a national laboratory facility that really benefits our life here on Earth and uh, will also be extended to additional users because of HICO becoming an ISS facility. So that summary really just touches the surface. Um, I urge you to look at the press kit on nasa.gov to see all of those hundreds of investigations going on. And uh, we look forward to a really dynamic and active research expedition. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Julie. Let's uh, take some questions now from the media. We'll start here in uh, Houston. Mark Corot. Thank you, uh, Mark Corot uh, from the um, Aviation Week in Space Technology. and. Uh, I think my question is is for Mike Suffredini, but uh, direct as, as needed. I believe you mentioned that March 28, the launch of the Soyuz, might be the first uh, four-orbit rendezvous flight of a Soyuz crew to the ISS, and you said you're assessing some issues yet that will be considered before final decision. I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit and whether uh, and also, if you could talk about the advantages of doing this and whether you would look to regularly do for orbit with Soyuz or that you would have a mix. I just kind of want to see where this was going in your mind. Very good. Uh, 
so those two are related, and so that's the answer to your first question: is you, you got to talk about the benefits and the and the uh, downsides in order to decide uh, if you'd like to do this uh, long term or, or or at all. So there's two factors. One is the the crew factors of a four orbit rendezvous, um, and then of course the other is the ground operations impact associated with the four orbit rendezvous. Uh, the four orbit rendezvous has uh, has the uh, advantage that you have a very short period of time from launch to uh, to docking. Uh, that's good from a, you know if you had to get to ISS quickly, you know how to do it. Uh, it reduces the amount of time the crew has to spend in a small environment before they get to ISS. Um, and uh, in addition to that, the neat thing about the way the Soyuz uh, trajectory goes is it's very easy to transition from a four orbit to a two day rendezvous um, if you have any, any issues. And I'll talk a little bit about one of the issues associated with that in a minute. Um, and so that's, a, that's certainly an attractive um, uh, set of reasons. The other, the other attractive thing about that is is there's a certain size of the ground ops team to control a, a free-flying spacecraft uh, that once it's docked to ISS and powered down, you can go to a very, very small team. So there's a cost savings with regard to flying those spacecraft uh, where you can trim down the flight ops team uh, from a 24-hour full-up team support that has to last for two plus days to one that could you know, last to about a day or so. Um, so those are the advantages. The downside is one is, in, and this first one is crew related. It's not really a downside, it's just working out the details. And that's a little bit about what Tony was talking to that we have to kind of sort out uh, amongst ourselves. And that is, there's just, there's just things you have to consider with the crew. You can't expect a crew to stay buckled up in those, and you've seen the, the uh, seat liners they sit in. You can't expect them to stay like that for the, for the eight hours or so that they're flying around. Uh, in space trying to get to ISS and so from the launch to from the time they get in the capsule to the time they get into ISS actually it's probably close to about 10 hours so they can't sit there all strapped in so we're working we're really just working the details can you get the crew out can they uh, go stretch can they use the facilities if necessary um, and then of course they have to be appropriately strapped in by the time they get close to uh, for rendezvous and, and prox ops and docking so we're just working those details, and we'll, we'll certainly be able to sort those out. The bigger question lies uh, in terms of uh, operational impacts. A four-orbit rendezvous means that you have to know precisely where ISS is uh, within pretty tight tolerances uh, at launch time. Um, and, and it's because you don't really have time for the Soyuz to make up the phase angle differences. Uh, that, that are inherent in a system like ISS. I, you can do no burns on ISS in any given orbit, and just because of the size and the nature of the ISS and the environment it flies in, the drag alone can vary enough because the environment varies enough that you can, the ISS won't be where you expect it to be. And, uh, and because you're talking about such tight tolerances, that's significant. So operationally, it doesn't sound too bad to you consider that today, if I do a debris avoidance maneuver, I have to consider whether that impacts a flight in March. Um, and so you can see from an ops standpoint, it becomes much, much more difficult now. Every time we do a maneuver, every time we have to do a debris avoidance maneuver, every time I do a reboost, not only do I worry about phasing, before I phased into a, a certain uh, angle uh, error angle, I'll say, and the Soyuz can make up the rest and progress can make up. Now it's much, much tighter. And so I'm worrying about that three or four months in advance. I'm worrying about whether or not I want to screw up my location uh, for the launch of that vehicle. And so that's turning out to be an enormous amount of work for the ops team. So that's part of what we have to work with our Russian colleagues to talk about the gain from the from the savings of time and getting to ISS quicker, does that offset the impacts that we're going to have just flying the ISS day to day? Uh, and so that's the future discussion that we have to have about long term. We, we have agreed fundamentally that we would like to go ahead and do this at least once or twice to show that we have the capability in case we need to get to ISS quick for any reason. Um, but the decision to fly like this long term is still out there to be determined. Okay. Anything else here in Houston? All right, let's go to the phone lines. Uh, Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Uh, a, a little choppy, but yeah, go ahead. 
Uh, this question is probably for Mike. Mike, I'm just wondering, um, there was some issues with the freezer when the blood and urine samples came down on the SpaceX Dragon the last time. I'm wondering, um, can you give us an update on how the samples turned out to be? Were they usable? And will there be another freezer aboard the next Dragon going up to bring down samples? Oh, that's, that's a great question question, Marcia. Um, first of all, the freezer itself was not uh, the issue. It was the power going to the freezer that was lost. Uh, we have analyzed, there was only a couple of samples that needed the minus uh, 80 degree temps. Um, and that was by design, by the way, because we knew there was a risk that we could lose power to the freezer on these first uh, couple of SpaceX flights. And I'll get to that in a moment. Um, and uh, based on detail analysis, we, it turns out we never did go below their lower limit. Uh, there has been a first look at the samples and they don't see any degradation. Um, and of course, they'll keep looking at them, but our final analysis says we actually never went below what their lower uh, temp limit was, or their upper temp limit, excuse me, was. Uh, so from that respect, it's okay. Our, uh, we've been working with SpaceX um, about these particular power components uh, that uh, provide power to the uh, freezers. They're, they're in a lower portion of the Dragon that sees water at splashdown. Uh, and they knew before that flight that this, this, the, the way the box is sealed, well, it just was not sealed up uh, good enough to prevent water intrusion. Uh, so we had this discussion. Uh, they, did, they did some extra things around the boxes, but they were already installed. And, and so we knew uh, that it was possible we'd get water in there at a level that would um, uh, submerge these boxes that could then ingest the water and, and ultimately fail. There was one contributing factor that we did fix uh, from the demo flight to the first flight, and that was um, that the chutes hung on a little bit longer to the spacecraft and drug it a little bit, which tended to bring more water into this lower area faster. They did, they did make a software change and, and have the chutes released quicker. Um, and so that did help. I, I think that bought us a little more time. But essentially, the, the fix that was necessary was to uh, do a better job of sealing up the boxes. And they had a redesign uh, in, in their plan for a SpaceX 3. Um, we've worked with SpaceX since then um, uh, to talk to them about uh, see if there's anything they could do. They've been very aggressive with this issue. They've uh, actually went and uh, pulled the boxes for SpaceX 2. They've come up with a design fix to seal up the boxes. Not the ultimate design that they're going to do in uh, for SpaceX 3 where they're, they're actually changing the box, but where they come in with the sealing material. Uh, they tested it on a box uh, in, a, in a water tank uh, and convinced themselves that they've sealed them up very good. Uh, and so this next flight, we have uh, higher confidence that uh, we won't lose power as early. Uh, and so that, again, we probably, because it's not the ultimate design fix, we'll still probably manage uh, and try to have uh, more of the minus uh, 20 degree uh, items in there because the freezer doesn't warm up that fast even if you lose power at touchdown. Um, but, but ultimately, we have the confidence we need to bring home some of the samples that we just have to get home that need the minus 80 degree temps. And so uh, I would tell you that we're, we're a little closer to nominal on uh, SpaceX 2 and, and, of course, the design that fix that we've all agreed to will be implemented on SpaceX 3. So uh, I think we've gotten ourselves past that. Thank you. And I had one other question, if I might, for you again, Mike. Um, we're coming quick upon the 10th anniversary of the Columbia accident, and I was hoping you could spend a few minutes um, just uh, talking about lessons learned and how those lessons are still alive in the space station program today to make it safer, better, if you don't mind. Um, of course, we all know uh, what the report said about the Columbia accident. There was a lot of things to focus on, and I would tell you that the primary thing uh, that we that we took away from um, from the Columbia accident was not to assume uh, things that seem easy for the uh, average engineer to assume. So, and what I mean by that was this whole discussion about the foam and and how light foam is that you know, and then you it's it's hard for you to imagine foam flying fast enough to cause any real damage. And and intuitively, it sounds. It sounds like uh, something that you could say, yeah, it's just foam, it'll probably be okay. Um, and, uh, and the bottom line is we just didn't do 
uh, the right amount of analysis to decide that uh, we understood the true impact of that. Um, and so to me, if you boil everything up that came from the, that particular uh, accident, I would tell you that was it. Uh, there was a, there was a intuitive thought that we understood that risk uh, without the appropriate amount of analysis to back up that intuitive thought. And that is today one of the strongest things we work on um, in the space business in general and certainly in the ISS program. It is, it is alive and well um, that we do, not, we do not make those assumptions. Now, you could say, well, you don't really have the final answer on anything. Uh, and so what you have to make sure is that all the appropriate individuals understand the environments that you're living in. So if you do make assumptions and you tend to try not to make too many, the only people allowed to make assumptions are the people that are truly experts in their field. So if they tell you that based on their experience this will be okay, then you can feel better about that as long as you understand the integrated uh, use of that object or whatever the, the system is you're, you're talking about. As long as you understand the integrated environment, then there are occasions when you can, can let experts make assumptions uh, and explain them to you. But largely that is not a practice we uh, uh, we use very often. In almost all cases for any critical systems we are doing a detailed analysis to understand not only what we know about that specific system but how it's used, how it operates in the integrated environment uh, which of course is one of the big um, big things that we didn't do in the in that particular part of the uh, of the foam impacting the wing leading edge of the of the shuttle and understand the slip stream that that the foam was flying in and, and the ultimate damage it could cause. Uh, so I would tell you that uh, that it's alive and well. We did that as a re, as a result of the CABE report. We did. There were a lot of very specific recommendations in the ISS program. We took every one of those recommendations and and related it to how we do ISS because in some cases they weren't directly relatable, but you could understand the concept. And then we did our own fix to that. We actually wrote a report that showed how we uh, we met the CABE findings as well. So so we're. Uh, we're, we're still very uh, sensitive to that, and the lesson we learned from that, I think, will stay with the agency uh, for its life. Okay, uh, Jim Lesher with NPR Washington. Jim, are you there? Okay, uh, let's go to Stephen Clark with Space Flight Now. Okay, it's my question for, uh, for Mike. Um, can you give us an update on the investigation into the engine failure um, during the uh, October SpaceX one launch? And is uh, has that been closed, or is that still an open issue um, that needs to be closed before March first? Thanks. Uh, the SpaceX engine anomaly. Uh, well, first of all, it's not completely closed. Uh, there's still some work to wrap up uh, and do the final closure. Uh, and we'll get into the details at the right time. We'll do that with our, our SpaceX colleagues that actually own that system. And there's some sensitivities in, uh, in, in all of this that we tried to avoid. Uh, but I can tell you that a very thorough review was uh, conducted. There was an enormous amount of data uh, provided um, that uh, the NASA engine guys and structures guys uh, and system guy, propulsion system guys all participated. Uh, with the SpaceX team to review the anomaly. Um, as, uh, as is often the case with a, with a failure like this on a system you don't get back, uh, it was hard to find a specific smoking gun to point to. Um, but a number of, of uh, things were believed to be contributors uh, that have been, been looked at and, uh, and the engines actually have been re-examined uh, in the NDE the examinations uh, to confirm uh, the health of the engines that are about to fly. Uh, in addition to that, a contributing factor uh, was perhaps um, the amount of testing that this engine and engine two on that same vehicle saw before it flew. Although it was uh, certified and all the testing it went through, none of those tests violated any of the design uh, criteria of the engine it's possible that the amount of testing that they were exposed to might have been a contributing factor. Uh, and these uh, engines flying on IS, uh, flying on this next flight are all uh, new engines that have been accepted, tested, but really have not participated in other test programs. Uh, so the combination of the additional NDE of the, well, I should say of the failure investigation, 
uh, what legs of the fault tree were remaining, the NDE, extra NDE that's been done to these engines, um, and the fact that these engines are all, uh, uh, from, a, from, a fl from a test time standpoint, have very uh, low test time on them, additional test time other than what is necessary to certify the engine for flight. Um, Will, will help us conclude that the uh, engines we have on, on this particular SpaceX flight are, uh, are good to go. Again, we haven't officially determined that. Um, the NDE uh, work is, uh, is concluded, but the review of the data uh, is not. Uh, so that work has to, to, to wrap up, and then there'll be a more formal uh, report at the end. Okay, how about uh, Bill Harwood with CBS? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, hi, it's Bill Hart with CBS News. A couple of quick ones for Suff Mr. Suffordini. Um, Is there any reason you can't tell us what they think is the cause of the engine anomaly? I mean, one of the things that's different about this commercial program is, you know, the lack of insight people on the outside have in ter terms of what's going on. I mean, you're telling me that you guys know what's going on, but I'm just curious if you're contractually prevented from telling us. And the second question, I was wondering if you could go over a little bit about uh, Bigelow and uh, you know, how that thing's going to work, you know, how often the hatch will be open, for example, things you hope to learn, that sort of thing. Just kind of a general overview of the, the Bigelow operation. Thanks. Uh, certainly, Bill. I'll be glad to. Uh, first of all, uh, this is kind of a new world for, uh, for all of us. Uh, you know, the SpaceX vehicle is the propriety of, uh, of, of the SpaceX Corporation, and so therefore there are, the, and the engines, as you well know, um, are very sensitive items. Uh, they're sensitive export control items and they're certainly uh, sensitive uh, proprietary uh, systems. And so, um, so in that respect, uh, the reason why NASA gets a large amount of data is we've agreed not to disclose this data. Uh, ultimately, I think the, uh, the uh, cause of the anomaly, uh, as we've talked about before, is, is probably has to do with a uh, a breach of the uh, uh, chamber, the pressure chamber, uh, and uh, and the team spent quite a bit of time trying to understand root cause to that, and uh, convincing themselves that uh, whatever the potential contributing factors are, uh, they are not a concern for these engines that are about to fly. And uh, if I got into much more specifics than that, then I'm, I'd be uh, treading perhaps on uh, proprietary information. And so, in order to uh, to um, make sure I don't talk about anything that we shouldn't disclose at this point. Um, I can tell you that uh, from a NASA and U.S. government standpoint, we have been deeply involved and are, are completely satisfied that the right amount of work's been done on these systems. As far as communicating up and out, we will rely on SpaceX to ultimately uh, uh, talk at, at, some of the, at some of the level of detail. So it's just kind of a, a balancing act we do to make sure we are sensitive to the, the corporate uh, needs while at the same time uh, getting uh, the right amount of information out there, uh, with, both within NASA and as much as we can out to the general public. Uh, the Bigelow module um, is really a, I'll call it a structural test uh, module for the ISS. Um, uh, it will be attached to the ISS uh, on the aft port of node three. Uh, it will be uh, inflated um, and then really the objective then is to test uh, that uh, kind of module technology, inflatable technology, long duration um, in space. Uh, really structurally speaking, um, it's, a, it's a big player. We'll, we'll do a little bit of understanding the flow within it. Um, uh, but, but largely this is a, this is a test a module or, or part of a technology demonstration on board ISS. Um, as such, and in order to keep the, uh, the integration costs down, uh, we don't intend to make it a habitable module uh, for ISS. It certainly could be used uh, for stowage if we so chose, and, and that'll perhaps be a discussion for, for the future, but the operational concept assumes the crew will not be in and out of there a lot. Uh, they need to get in there to, to configure it, um, uh, but for the most part, uh, they won't go in there as a matter of course. Um, and, uh, and that allowed us to reduce some of the normal things you'd put in a module uh, to make sure it's safe for the crew. So because of the need to keep the cost down, because really this is a, a technology demonstration uh, capability, we've, uh, 
Uh, we've done that by assuming that the crew won't be uh, in and out of there on a regular basis. Hopefully that kind of answered your question. Yeah, it does. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to Dana with ABC News Radio. Okay, let's go to James Dean, Florida Today. Thanks, uh, Mr. Seferdini. Could you just provide a quick primer on the, the KU system and, and why it's so important and, and I guess what the impact would be if you if you had a problem with your, your backup as well? And, and then also I was just curious why. I think you, you've said that you are considering three EVAs. Um, is, is that, um, that, that just seemed like quite a lot for um, what you only identified, I think, one sort of major um, uh, a problem that needs repair, and I, so I just was wondering what, what uh, the rest of the, the content might be. Uh, certainly. Um, I'll do your last question first. Um, the, um, so one of, the, one of the things that we focus on now on the ISS is to make sure we provide the right amount of research time on board. As you, as you know, uh, EVA time, uh, we, we, we estimate about 100 hours to prepare for and conduct uh, an EVA. Uh, all of that would come out of time available for research. And uh, anomalies don't schedule themselves up according to when is best for the research guys to go outside and fix them. And so um, we have to try to figure out a way to manage our lives around that. One way to do that is you pick the best time in the increment when you know, based on traffic and other things going on, when you could fit this activity in. And then when you think about the work necessary to prepare for, part of, prepare for an EVA, part of that work is to configure the airlock, get the suits out, uh, check out the suits, fit the suits to the crew. Um, once you've done all that, you've, you've, you, that's work you'd like to not repeat. So if you know all the work you're going to go do, uh, what you try to do is, um, is to uh, get as many EVAs as you can before you have to go recheck re the suits or, or, uh, or uh, flush the, the cooling lines or any number of things we have to do uh, before we go into EVA if it's been quite a bit of time. So there's an efficiency to trying to go outside a few times in a row. Uh, you can't do a whole bunch. The, the crew would be exhausted and, and ultimately you got to get back to, uh, to doing the research. But if you know you got enough tasks to keep you busy, uh, then, then uh, you try to get as much of those done if you know you got them coming. So we have a list of things that need to be done uh, on the ISS. Um, some that are, are time critical and some that aren't, but they're just, they just have to happen. Uh, we, uh, Tony talked about lubing the, uh, the two Sarge joints. We're finding now that it's probably gonna, we're gonna need to lube them probably within the next year or so. Uh, and so uh, that's on the list of things to do now. Uh, this KU uh, transceiver problem is something we'll have to go do. We have to finish running the cables uh, from the US segment to the interface to the Russian segment. These are the power and data cables. Uh, uh, for the MLM, so we have to complete that task. We have a PMA2 cover that we need to put on, um, and uh, we have an AMS, uh, has a new blanket we're trying to install uh, to reduce some of the thermal uh, issues that it sees that we have to protect for today. Uh, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some. So as you, you just hear that list, you can figure out that all of these have to be done at some point, and so you try to figure the best, if you don't have to run outside tomorrow, to fix a critical system, then you try to pick a time when you can do it, knowing that by the time you get there, there may be something else that's more important than some of these other items and you'll stick it on the list. And that goes to the next thing, which is when we used to do shuttle flights, crews trained, it was something to seven to 10 to one for each task you're gonna do uh, outside. We don't do that in the ISS program. By the time the guys finish training and get to orbit and actually go outside for their EVA, several months have usually passed. Uh, and during that time, other things can happen. And so we, will, we train the crew uh, on the ground for what we think they're gonna have. We train them generically to, to uh, do uh, kind of normal maintenance out, outside. But what that means is you have to plan more time for an EVA for any one task than we used to in the shuttle program. So those two things combined, not knowing exactly what you're doing, not training at the same level, says it takes a little longer to go out to, to do the, just the, whatever the task is, takes a little longer. And so if you got a lot of tasks to do, you should probably assume that it'll take more than one EVA. And then of course there's the things you run into once you go outside. 
So that's, uh, that's how we schedule it, schedule it up. The KU problem we have, of course, it's, a redun it's redundant. The KU system is considered crit three, but over the years, uh, we've become to rely on it heavily. And so it used to not be a redundant system. We, uh, towards the end of the shuttle program, one of the things, one of the mods we made to the station was add a redundant KU system. Uh, and so fortunately, we've done that and we're not losing any data. But all the video you see, a lot of the data that comes down comes through the KU system. We've, uh, we have a very, very limited uplink capability. In fact, there wasn't in the original design to do uplink, but we figured out how to do that uh, so that we can use it not only, not only for getting research uh, things up, but actually primarily for the operations team to use it to get images up and video up for the crew. It's, it's really much more helpful. A picture is worth a thousand words when you're trying to do things on orbit. Uh, and so this has become something we've relied on. Uh, the, the new comm system that you'll hear us talk about that we're about to install here in the next few months, we refer to it as the, as the ICU, uh, will actually uh, double the downlink capability and provide 25 uh, megabits up uh, so we can even utilize the KU system where it also is adding a couple of, of uh, comm loops for the crew. Uh, so we can have more discussions in different modules. So, so we're becoming uh, very reliant on the KU system, even though it's a CRIT-3 system. And so making sure we have this redundant capability is, is uh, becoming important to us. We can live without it, for sure, uh, but it would be a, a big impact if we lost it. To follow up very quickly, I'm not sure what uh, CRIT-3 means. And, and um, just very simply put, is, is this then like the main your main communications link between the ground and, and the station? Well, I would say uh, CRIT-3 is just a lower, the, the highest criticality in ISS is one, and it's, it's for vehicle and crew safety. It's, and if that's required, then those systems are CRIT-1 systems, the ECLIS systems, the S-band communication system that is our primary command and control capability, the ISS is considered CRIT-1 and has all the redundancies necessary uh, for a CRIT-1 a system. CRIT-3 is just the lowest criticality. It's, it's not something you have to have. Um, and what's happened is we've become so reliant on it and we like its capability so much and it saves us so much time uh, that we've, uh, we uh, want to get it uh, redundant so that we don't have to live without it. But the primary means for command and control of the International Space Station is through the S-band communication system, which is uh, the highest criticality and has all the redundancies uh, we require. Okay, uh, let's see if Tamara Dietrich is there with the Daily Press in Newport, Virginia. Tamara, are you there? Okay, well that's going to wrap it up for us. Coming up at 1 p.m. Central Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time here on NASA Television, we will have the Expedition 35 crew news conference with the entire crew, Pavel Vinogradov, Alexander Mazurkin, and Chris Cassidy will be here taking questions from the media and talking about uh, what's ahead for them. So again, that's at 1 p.m. Central Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And of course, if you would like to learn more about what's ahead for Expeditions 35 and 36, just log on to nasa.gov slash station. Once again, it's www.nasa.gov slash station. And if you'd like to take a look at uh, everything Julie talked about in these experiments, just look on the left-hand side of the page. You'll see Research and Technology, and just click on Experiments, and you can read all about them. So we'll see you back here at 1 o'clock. We want to thank you for joining us.